This podcast is proudly sponsored by Gyro Drilling. They provide world-class drilling solutions for all types of projects. They specialize in auger, air core, and RC drilling. Head to the team at Gyro Drilling for all your mining needs and see how they can help you with your upcoming project. Hello, I'm Ben Kostrich, and this is the Market Bull Podcast. As this podcast grows, every subscriber helps. From those of you who watch this on YouTube or to those that listen on Spotify and Apple, every follower helps. If you do this one favor and hit follow on whatever platform you find us on, I promise I will continue to look and find fascinating people across the world and bring their perspectives to you. Thank you and enjoy this episode. So hello, I'm Ben Kostrich and this is the Market Bull Podcast. Joining me today remotely is Simon Hunt, the founder of Simon Hunt Strategic Services, which provides research and analysis on global markets and economies, uh, in particular a focus on geopolitics, China and, and the copper industry, which we'll probably go through a little bit later on in the show. But welcome, Simon. Uh, nice to be with you. Nice to be back in Perth, if not physically, online. Yes. When I reached out to you, uh, it's always fun trying to figure out the time zones and you're based in Dubai, uh, but you've got a UK accent and I can imagine your history has taken you all across the world. So for listeners and viewers that are unfamiliar with perhaps your story and your experience in market with over 30 plus years, what is your story? Travel was in my blood since I was a baby. My uh, parents lived in Burma and my mother uh, had to go back to Yorkshire in England so that I was eligible to play cricket for, in for Yorkshire. So ever since then, I've, I've been traveling, I've lived in Northern Rhodesia, Southern Rhodesia, sorry, Zambia and Zimbabwe. Started my first consultancy in 1975, Brook Hunt and Associates. Left 20 years later, got too big. Um, spent the 80s and early 90s focusing on North America. Then in 1993, started focusing on China. And for the next uh, 25 odd years, I was spending two to three months in China, visiting on average 80 factories in di 50 different towns and cities. And uh, then in December, 2020, I got so fed up with all the restrictions in England that I said, I need three months holidays three months holiday on two conditions, hot weather and where I can play tennis. And I found this lovely resort in a place I'd never heard of before called Fujera. Well, Fujera is a province of the UAE. I was there for about a week when Boris Johnson locked everybody out. And uh, a couple of months later, I said to myself, do I really want to go back to the UK? So I phoned my two kids up. Uh, how often do you see me every year? The answer was, oh, dad, once a year if we're lucky. So I therefore decided to stay and I'm here. I'm very happy to be here in Dubai. We'll, we'll touch on that because, yeah, the, that was my, the curiosity is the hub of uh, Dubai and the UAE. And really that probably leads into now the, the global outlook and probably more so the, the tensions that are arising between governments and really just global markets more so. Uh, so given where we're now in 2024, the intensity of COVID lockdowns and restrictions have come and gone, but some of the tensions between countries and regulations are arguably more rampant than ever, given Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, we've still got tensions with China, US and Taiwan all bundled in and who knows what other spot fires are slowly growing. But Looking at the current state of global markets, what's your take on the potential future of what was really unfolding before our eyes? That's a massive question, not a simple one to answer, but you've hit the nail on the head. It's really what we should be looking at and not 
the what markets seemingly seemingly seem to think is going on, soft landing, everything is hunky dory, the world's in a good place. Um markets will continue to improve, economies will recover, and we're off to to heaven. Unfortunately, I think that is extremely misplaced. The American economy is actually far weaker than the headline numbers are showing, whether it be GDP, employment, or inflation. Real actual inflation is closer to 10% than 3%. Just go back to all the manipulations that the Bureau of Labor Statistics BLS have done since the days of Arthur Burns in the 1970s, take out all those games that they have been played to manipulate the data. And you find that as of January this year, actual inflation is closer to 11% than 3%. And they've done the same thing with employment data. Again, if you take out all the changes that they've made in uh, how employment is is recorded, you come up with a figure twenty five percent. The main reason for that is people have just not have decided not to go into the labor force for whatever reason government handouts, or they made money in the stock exchange, or whatever. So no wonder the labor market was so tight. And now what you're seeing, particularly you will see over the next two months, the employment data will be falling very sharply. Governments, uh, companies are already announcing huge layoffs. They see 2024 as a period where costs have got to be cut. And what's the best way of doing it? Back to the usual thing, cut your labor force. By the time we get into April, we're going to find that, <coughs> excuse me, that the American economy is actually in recession and probably has been as some um, informed economists are saying, has been since October last year. Then if you look at Europe, Europe is in recession. Just look at um, electricity consumption across the whole of Europe, and it was down 5.8% last in 2022. And the IEA is estimating to be down 6% this year. What does that mean? Doesn't mean you've got a, a recovering economy. Uh, China, China's economy is going through a massive transition, which is going to take some years to complete. But in the meantime, consumers have lost confidence in the government's ability to promote growth. It's probably a semblance of disagreement within the leadership as to how the economy should be governed, uh, a fight between those who want to return to centralization and those who want the private sector to be the main driver of growth again. So I think, so what we're seeing at the moment is weak consumption, weak confidence. But I think that in the Mar uh, NPC meeting, I think some form of compromise has probably been reached between the two factions in the leadership. And we will see a huge uh, fiscal stimulus to finance infrastructure projects geared towards local governments. So this will give us a, and if you look at real M1 numbers in January, 
um, there was a resurgence in real money supply growth. So I think that probably in the second half of this year, we will see a cyclical recovery in China, but it's only a cyclical one, which probably won't last more than a year. So then we have to look at what's really going on in the world outside finance and uh, economic growth. And that is the big picture is the growing conflict between America and Russia and China. And this is, first of all, we need to go back to 1991, if not the end of World War II, when it has been Washington's policy to dismember Russia in order to gain control of the huge natural resources that Russia possesses, both agriculture, energy, and minerals and metals. So the first war, that's what Ukraine was really all about. It's clear that NATO has lost that war or this part of the war. And now the second front of the war against Russia is being opened in the Middle East but the probability that Israel will launch a massive attack in the coming weeks against Hezbollah. And Hezbollah is both in Lebanon and in uh, Syria. So what do we have in Syria? Syria has a treaty with Russia. So if there's a massive attack against Syria, then that risks Russia coming to the aid of the Syrian government. But one forgets that recently a treaty was signed between Russia and Iran. Each country coming to the defense of the other should they be attacked. And then in the background, you've got China, who has this huge uh, infrastructure, 25-year infrastructure, program with Iran. What are we going to see? Our guess is that really in the Middle East, arising out of the big summit meeting that was held in Riyadh a few months ago, what did we see? We saw all the Gulf countries, president of Iran, President of Tehran, sorry, the president of, of Turkey, being warmly greeted personally by MBS. What is that telling us? It's telling us that the Muslim countries have come together to help each other. There is not a war between Iran and Saudi or between Iran and the other Gulf countries. They're all Muslims and they've come together. So we've had the UK, France, and America have had their fingers in the Middle East for years. And what the countries in the Middle East are now saying, we don't want you here. We've matured. We can look after our own problems. We want you out. That I think is the big picture. And basically, I think it's going to lead to what you might call the last stand of, in, of America and the UK in the Middle East, which is going to lead to a big escalation of the conflict here. How that plays out is difficult to piece together. But there are enough dots to suggest that, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, there will be this huge escalation on Israel's northern front by attacking Hezbollah. Then what we've got is big escalation in Iraq, 
with the recent hit on an Iraqi insurgent's car, which killed him. What people forget is that particular, and I forget the name, Iraqi insurgency group is actually part of the Iraqi military. So now you're going to find that the Iraqi government is telling America, get out. Will America get out? Probably not. So I think in the next two to three months, we are going to see a big escalation in this part of the world. The risk, and I emphasize it's risk, it's not a forecast. The risk is that as a consequence, Iran will block the Straits of Hormuz to all shipping. From what I understand, they have set detonators on the seabed, which they can explode at will. The Houthis will continue to disrupt shipping in the Red Sea. And eventually that will mean, this is a risk of course, but a real one will mean the closure of the Suez Canal to all shipping. I would say that within, where are we now? Early 24. Within 18 months, this will all explode, causing oil prices well over 200. What will that do? It will implode the global derivative market and will send the world into recession, if not something worse. What will come out of that? Probably Russia will announce at some point in the next two years that they will sell oil related to the gold price, i.e. one barrel of oil equals X grams of gold. Uh, what will China do? China's citizens, whether institutions or households, own something over 20,000 tons of gold. So China will say, our citizenships own X tons of gold, our currency, is therefore backed by gold. Doesn't mean that it's convertible into gold, it's backed by gold. China will follow suit. China's got probably north of 12,000 tons in reality, not the 1,200 that its central bank holds. You're going to find that gold will come back into the monetary system, more by the back door than the front door. Though I'm told that in America, there are, I think, 15 states that have said that gold and silver will be linked to our currency. I don't know the details of that. Somebody sent me a note saying that's what is likely to happen. And in America, look what's happening between Texas and the federal government. So is this the start of a complete restructuring of America? You've got, how is it, 25 other states that support Texas. So it's the blue states versus the red states. Mm. And then if you look at Europe, revolutions always start from the countryside. With the farmers. See that farms. through history. It's the peasants who revolt. And today's peasants are revolting. They're revolting against not only their own governments, but more so against Brussels, who impose arbitrary laws on how farmers should run their land. And these are bureaucrats who probably know nothing about agriculture or farming. So I think there's a massive world pivot about to break out and will break out sometime over the next two years. Yeah. I'm yeah so that's science. a brief summary. <laughs> yeah. You covered it pretty pretty much. I'm afraid I'm sorry about that. No, you pretty much covered everything again across the globe and being in Australia, we're not necessarily exposed 
to a lot of these conflicts or issues that are ranging in the Middle East, to China, to Europe, to the US, we're very comfortable being in, in bubbles. And that's potentially a lot of Western world at the moment. But what you're talking about is really the world is on a bit of a precipice. It's potentially this unraveling of a lot of tensions, a lot of build up, and a lot of history that's potentially leading us towards more conflict and really a global restructure of powers. Um, the currency point that you alluded to was incredibly interesting because Russia, uh, quite a few years ago during COVID, and not COVID, when the war began, apologies, uh, they backed their currency by gold. And the history would dictate that when countries have backed their currency by gold, the US have usually been involved to stop it as it's a threat to the US dollar. And that's again, all beginning to unfold now with you talk about Ukraine and Russia and the US involvement there. There's a lot of threats with currency and you mentioned China potentially going down that path. How much of a role do you think something like that is playing? in, you know, where this future world goes, because the U S is founded on their currency pegging almost every other economy. Whereas if you back a currency by gold, suddenly investors alike, as well as countries would much rather use that form of currency. Do you think that is another potential reason why there's this growing tensions or more so BRICS versus the West or the G7 countries. And there's this emerging rivalry or, or polling for power. What are, what are your thoughts on, on those concepts? America has founded its global dominance with its currency. Go back to when the dollar backed gold currency broken by Nixon in, what was it, 1971, I can't remember the date. Since then, it's become a fiat currency. It doesn't matter how much, how many dollars they print in excess of their growth of GDP. I mean, in the last four years, America's debt has risen, I think, by 46%. And its economy by 26 or 27 percent. And the rest of the world looks at this and says, uh, do I really want to hold my reserves in dollars? And then when countries stop doing that, which they will step by step, China's certainly done it in recent years, who's going to fund the debt? It's going to be America. What does that mean? It's part of this war that will build between America, or I should say America, America's led G7 and the BRICS. And again, if you go back through history, other than Britain happily negotiated their way out of the empire, their empire, all other empires have failed, but they failed because they used their last resort, which was power, war, and they lost, each one lost the war. And this is what's going to happen. So I think what, what will emerge in cutting things down to reality is that between now and say April, we're looking for the S&P and most other global equity markets to fall by at least 30%. That wakes, that's a wake up call for central banks. Even at the same time, we will probably be seeing an intensification of the wars in, uh, over Europe and in the Middle East. So central banks completely reverse policy. QE comes in, in loads, interest rates are dropped. 10 years having probably, first of all, reached by the end of April, over 5%, dropped to 3%. What will then happen 
is the dollar starts falling sharply. The dollar index, which is now around about 104, will probably reach about 90 by the end of this year. Will we get a recovery, economic recovery, but very inflationary, given one, what central banks will be doing to liquefy the system, two, energy prices will be resurging, three, Food prices will be exploding, particularly driven by climate reasons. By the end of this year or early next year, the resurgence of the 89 year Gleisberg cycle, which caused the decade, the Dust Bowl decade in the Midwest, which of course, as you know, is great farming belt of America. Markets will love the euphoria. Equity markets and metal markets will probably double more than double in value between the lows, <clears throat> say, mid-2025. Mid and then the music will stop. The music will stop because the bond vigilantes will hate what they see. Global inflation will be 15% plus. America's inflation will be well over 10%. So we have 10 year treasuries yielding plus 10%. Comparable long term rates across Europe, mostly the rest of the world, will be in double digit figures. What does that do to a highly debt laden world? crash. And this is what will happen. Some of my friends saying, actually, by the end of this year, but I'm sort of saying we'll start mid 2025. And then we have seven years of put politely rolling recessions, which are in, in effect, in effect will be a depression. And that's when the big wars start. Doesn't mean nuclear. Russia and China don't need to go down that route, nor does Iran. They've got hypersonic missiles. <laughs> Sorry. It, 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 no, it's, it, it does. It, it almost takes your breath away. You, you throw the word crisis out there. Uh, you know, you don't use that phrase lightly, but it does feel that the doom and gloom is quite well, impending, uh, and I'm more of a perpetual optimist. It's just the, the, the person who I am, but for most people, I was that, when I was your age, <laughs> but most, most people would be looking at this and thinking, what, what really can I do? And it sort of puts you in a position where you go, well, what do I look at either from an investment point of view or more so from just hopefully not going to some form of global conflict. And it's hard to put it on the individual to, to solve these problems. Do you see any potential solution that comes out of this, either from, you know, global leaders taking the initiative and having these conversations and finding these tension resolutions, or even potentially from an investment point of view, you talked about, you know, potential of gold rising as humans naturally, uh, approach gold in times of tension and crises and how would you say it? Bad times, but agriculture is another one. Energy prices from an investment philosophy, where would people be looking to go? All this doom and gloom is unfolding, but at the same time, I can potentially look at casting aside a nest egg by some smart deployment of capital. So. From there, have you got particular insights of where you'd well, be think, looking at it? First of all, you play the cycles. I were in a down cycle now. Say around mid year, we come out of the down cycle. And that's where you go back into the up cycle. The up cycle, which will be very powerful, is not going to last long. 
So you don't want to be the last guy on the dance floor when the music stops. A parabolic rise. Yeah. And then you just need to be, to be long, long gold, long silver, long agriculture, and store more food than your daily consumption. Mm. And this is one of the facts that's going to drive inflation because everybody's going to do the same thing. You as a family guy will buy more than your daily use. Industry will see falling dollar, rising inflation. They double up on inventory, right down the supply chain. So physical metal consumption soars. It happens every time when having dumped all their inventory, we're clearly nearing that point now through the whole supply chain. So it feeds onto your brass mills and your wire rod mills. Then everybody replenishes, not just replenishes, but then adds to the inventory. And that's where you get your boom. And then you get the crash for all the reasons we've talked about. Mm. Well, I'll give you a simple example. It happened after the event. I then had as a client, a very major American chemical company. If you remember in the period 1979 to 1980, huge rise in inflation, dollar falling sharply. And this chemical company told me after the event, as their hedge, they bought 200,000 tons of physical copper, which is probably more like 500,000 tons today. So I said, did you make money on it? He said, no, but we had our hedge. So you can think in today's terms, given that markets are much more easy to operate in rather than in the 1970s. Think of the number of companies will do something similar. I mean, that, that's why, I mean, in this current down cycle, we've got copper falling to six and a half thousand dollars. And what we're now around about 8,000 now. But then we're going to close to 14,000. People look at me and say, how can that be, Simon? I said, go back to summer of 79 and summer of 1980. The copper price rose by 75%. That was then. So and copper is copper's just one example. Yeah. Well, I want to pick your brain a bit more about copper, actually, because that's part of your also ethos that you've focused on over the years, uh, at least from, from the website that I'll put on the, the show notes. But why copper racing away, uh, almost they say copper is the reflection of a healthy economy. And I'm seeing a lot of discussions more so about the dwindling supply and copper is meant to be having this impending Full run because of those uh, deficits. Yeah, do you do you anticipate, as you just said, there copper having a, a short term acceleration, and then if if it does go as we've discussed down this treacherous um, a potential path, that it all just comes undone anyway. There are two sides to <clears throat> the price equation: it's the demand side, and there's the supply side. On the demand side. Despite what the bulls are saying, physical consumption is weak. Just look at the difference between cash and three months copper. If the market was tight, then the contango would narrow sharply, but it's not. It's over a hundred dollars. What's that telling you? Plenty of immediate supply. What we do have later on in the, uh, we have significant supply issues, strikes in a number of countries, logistical problems. For instance, not enough containers in any African port to ship what comes out of 
Africa, DRC and Zambia. Probably this year there will be strikes in the DRC and Zambia because inflation is soaring there. Well, probability is we'll have strikes in Chile. It's the year when they have uh, labor negotiations. But underneath it all is the reported numbers of copper contained in concentrates is about 3% too high than what smelters receive. That 3% is a massive figure. As demand picks up the second half of this year, you're going to get these restrictions on supply. And in round numbers, we have a deficit of something like 600,000 tons all of which appears in the second half of this year. But then add in what industry is going to do to replenish inventories and what financial institutions will do to buy physical as hedges, the, the actual deficit is going to be 900,000 million, which is why we have this explosion in copper prices. But we're not there yet. We're in the down mm. cycle. And then the other point that everybody says, well, you've got the green economy. Well, I'll tell them something. First, EVs, if they didn't peak globally last year, will peak this year. Just look at the blowback that EVs are getting. Dealers can't sell EVs. What are they then saying to the EV producers? We want less. Just yeah, don't want any more. Consumers, you know, it was a fashionable thing. Oh, I've got an EV. Now they're realizing the cost of running an EV. Both insurance is about double what a IC car is. Um, when you have an accident, it's several times higher to repair and charging. So and then on wind and solar, wind and solar has survived on subsidies. Look what happened in Germany. Siemens went to the government for a, oh, I've forgotten the figure, some 3 billion, 5 billion bailout Jeez. because of the uh, wind power projects. And then the government is now saying, sorry, guys, or sorry, the Supreme Court is saying, sorry, guys, you've been pilfering government deposits that should not be used to subsidize um, solo or wind power. Government deficits will get bigger and bigger. Uh, debt issues get bigger and bigger. How much longer can they afford? to subsidize wind and solar. So I, I would suggest that in the next couple of years, wind and solar, renewables and EVs will have peaked. That's, that's reality. Can't get rid of fossil fuels. And look at, the, look at the profits that the oil companies are making and look at the losses that renewables have been making. Yeah. That's reality. It, it's an interesting point, the, even in Western worlds, there's a lot of subsidies for electric vehicles and eventually they cease to exist uh, and the chickens come home to roost as they were and consumers, as you mentioned, come to the decision that it might be great and all to have a car supposedly good for the environment, but I also need to feed myself and my family and pay for my bills. And really the cost of living will become the key distinguishing factor as to what I own and purchase. And that's the looming headwinds, you would say, polite pun from, what? from wind farms, but. It's again, it comes back by the Davos crowd who control most governments. Think so if I control the governments, I've got you, but no. The people rebel, the people will throw out the governments and they will vote in the governments who think about the people and not about Davos. And we've covered, well, 
almost the entire globe in conversations. And there are so many threads that arguably we could have gone down further and I'll have to be getting you back again to, to pull on some of those threads, but for listeners and viewers, arguably that have now been infatuated with some of the conversations that we've had more so about following yourself and your commentary, where can they go to reach out to you or follow your, your global commentary and opinions of what's unfolding? Oh, thank you for asking simon-hunt.com. There we go. And does that provide, that provides some services and, and newsletters and, and other options for, for people to yep. follow you? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Well, yeah, I'll be putting that in the links. And as I just alluded to, I'll need to get you back probably, hopefully before this <laughs> impending potential war, uh, fingers crossed that doesn't happen, but we know that we need potentially competent and people willing to come together and have these discussions to progress somewhere, but there are a lot of egos around and I've seen a lot saying that we're a bit of a narcissistic society. Uh, so it's a bit hard for, for some of us to approach these conversations with a, a non-bias, uh, with the potential of what's best for everyone. But thank you so much, Simon, for taking the time. I know you're an avid tennis player, so you might be going back to play some <laughs> today yeah, yeah, or tomorrow. I'm to talk tonight and then it's <laughs> fantastic. tomorrow morning. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for, for speaking on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. Very good to chat with you. Thanks for listening to the Markable Podcast. Please remember that the topics and stocks discussed in this podcast are not financial advice. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to like, share and follow. You can follow the Markable on all our socials and keep up to date with global market insights.